So happy Friday, everybody. Um, I'm going to go ahead. We have a bunch of different things to get to today. I thought what we would start with is um, Molly had asked about second line. So I have, I'm going to share my screen. Before I do, sometimes it helps if I open what I'm going to do first. Okay. So I think I'm going to share my screen. And we are going to talk about... Second line. So hopefully you can see my screen and you can hear me. So what is second line? Well, I had to look it up myself. Um, it had been a while since I tried to remember why it was called that. I know what it is, but I don't always remember why it got the name. So it originated in New Orleans and it was from second line parades. And these are the parades that occur before and after a funeral. So this is kind of like the processional. There's two separate lines. The first one is for the deceased person's family. It also usually will have a brass band of some kind and sometimes the hearse and that could be carried by horses or people or something like that. Um, the second line was for snare, bass drummers, dancers, and others. And on the way to the funeral, there'd be slow kind of somber songs played um, by that first line and they'd be things like sweet low sweet chariot and things like that kind of um, very mournful and sad and then afterwards there'd be the celebratory songs like when the saints go marching in is a most really popular one and people would would play and dance and it was a party and this dates back to the 1800s and it had a huge impact on the development of jazz and funk and rock and it has a very characteristic sound but as we know in music it's modified and morphs into other things and so again here we are with the clave we've talked about the clave before there's the two three clave and the three two clave but second line is based on the two three clave and if you're not sure how this goes it's rest play play rest play 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 rest play play rest play 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 ba 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 the reason they call it a two three clave you notice there's two notes kind of in the first measure and three in the second and this is kind of a triplet it's not written like a triplet but it sounds like a triplet so that's what it gives it that kind of cool feel. If we were to do a 3-2 clave, we'd kind of start with the three component. Ba, 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 ba. So you can kind of hear the difference. They're really, you know, similar but different just by switching things around. And there's some examples. So I thought we would pull up some of these and see if we hear what they say is there. So an example is um, by Fats Domino. Let's hear if we hear what they think is second line-ish. Okay, hopefully this will pull up and we can hear it well. So give it a second. Okay, here we go. Let's listen. And so far, I don't hear anything either. Everything's on. Come on. Ugh. Well, I might have to send it to you. I see the little things working. My phone is turned up. Everything's on. Everything's connected. Maybe I have to add it to my library. Then I'll go to my library and hear it. Sometimes. Recently added. Okay. Well... Might have to come back to that. It looks like it's playing, but for some reason I'm not hearing it. Download. Let's try downloading it. All right. Well, fail. 
epic fail once again. All right, and then uh, so I will send this to you, and y'all can listen to it on your own. Uh, I'm not sure why it's not allowing me. Maybe it wants me to buy it. Usually on Apple Music, I can. That's why you pay a monthly pr uh, subscription, so you get get to hear stuff, but you don't really own it. But sometimes there's weird rules on different songs. Okay, well, anyway, here's some examples. So on your own, I'll send this to you. If you have iTunes, click on them, and hopefully you can actually get to hear and see if you see it. Maybe we'll come back to it at the end if we have time, but I hate to waste your time fumbling around. Um, other things, there's a Mardi Gras Mambo, um, and I tried to pick different eras. Uh, I have a whole list of songs that are examples, but I thought it'd be fun to do one from the 50s, one from the 70s, and then one more recent. So even Wynton Marsalis uh, has, um, in fact, he named the tune Second Line, and it's a live performance. So that might be fun later to try to um, listen to and see if you hear this uh, at the root of it. And so let's, you know, you cannot talk about second line drumming, especially without mentioning this man's name. So Stanton Moore, I have not gotten a chance to meet him. I've seen him. I've seen him play. Um, he was born in 1972. He is a Grammy award-winning American funk, jazz, and rock drummer from New Orleans. He's, uh, he does a lot through, through the pandemic. He did a lot of online, free uh, join him on Facebook Live, and there'd only be like 100 people watching, but um, if you get a chance to explore his playing, he's very well known for his uh, band, Galactic, and he's also done a lot independently. He's written several books, of which here's one, and uh, I actually, I didn't buy it, but I have a couple of students that were studying out of it that I was helping with it. Um, he travels internationally, and he talks about New Orleans drumming. Um, he writes for drum magazines again he's got a number of books and he's even got this Stanton Moore drum academy that you can pay an amount and actually have access to videos and critique by him and things like that so it's kind of cool that again sort of with the pandemic a lot of people have had to get creative if you're a live musician and you rely on you know playing live you had to get creative to continue your you know uh, source of income so um there's a couple of YouTube links. I, I want to try the first one, and hopefully this is going to work. I have it already uploaded, but I'll click right here, and let's just listen a little bit. I know this one will work. And then later, this other one you can click on for fun and just go to his academy and kind of see you know, what he offers. So let's click on this so we can hear a little bit of Second Line. And he's the master of it. syncopated second line this is a groove that i feel is very important to tackle it's going to help you improve your groove in a lot of other areas there are some nuances here that are particular to this groove but these nuances if you can get them down they're going to translate to a lot of other grooves in a lot of other contexts as well let's take a look now at what is going to be our basic new orleans syncopated second line groove this is going to be our foundation we're going to vary things from here but this is going to be our starting point. This is what we're going to be continuing to come back to. So I'm going to clack the clave. Now we're going to take that and we're going to add buzzes to it. We're going to add super crushed buzz rolls. Then we're going to gradually elongate those so we're aiming for a seamless buzz roll. This is what we call thing number three or thing three in the buzz roll lesson which is academy lesson number one. Static. 
So I have a go-to variation that I like to do, which is where we just anticipate the one of the second measure. It's a little bit of a variation, but it's not too adventurous, and it's a good go-to pattern for me, and I like to start off with this one often. start to talk about varying the bass drum a little bit more one of my favorite things to do is to chase the accents and what that is is we're going to chase the snare drum accents with a note immediately following on the bass drum so right now i'm going to play four bars where i'm going to play our two bar pattern and repeat it and chase those accents then i'm going to play over the bar line and chase the accents talking about this traditional New Orleans syncopated second line, I do want to point out that I use this kind of stuff and I use these ideas in funk and other styles and contexts all the time. So right now, I'm just going to go ahead and play a little bit of funk and then I'm going to use some of these traditional New Orleans buzzed second line ideas as my fills. bell so you can be notified when I post future lessons and videos here on my YouTube channel. I would love to have you come Okay, so hopefully you got a chance to really appreciate that. So basically, he is doing, you know, and I've talked a lot about, you know, where buzz rolls, you don't do a lot of buzz rolls. The places where you do buzz rolls are in orchestra a lot of times. And buzz rolls are those ones where it's just like you just take your sticks on the snare and just kind of go back and forth. I can't really do it so much on an electronic drum because it's so incredibly sensitive. You want a drum that's a little looser. So typically you'll... Uh, tune your snare drum a little bit looser so when you kind of just push your stick down and kind of crush into the head instead of just getting a single tap you get a zzz, zzz. and most of like marching band kind of stuff like more drum core you don't want that you want an incredibly sensitive head and they do some buzzing but it's meant to be very articulate you want to hear every single note so our rolls are open rolls much more distinct. You hear each note da 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 rather than zzzz. And so with um, buzz rolls, you kind of do this stirring almost. And instead of hitting the head and coming off with a rebound, you push it into the drum. So instead of playing off the drum, you play in 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 down 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 like that, and you get that characteristic. And if your snares are loose, the wires on the bottom, it gives you a nice smooth kind of sound. And so so what he was doing, you could tell at times he had a really tight buzz and then he would open it up. It got a little more loose and he kind of demonstrated that. And then the other thing that he was talking about is how his bass drum was following. So instead of going, you know, ba, 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 as soon as you'd hit this one, the bass would go, ba, 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 ba. Uh, so the bass drum was following exactly after it. It gives it that really nice feel. You can almost feel like dancing. And this, you know, again, started in like a parade. So it does very much sound when he's got his bass drum and his hi-hat going, like you're marching. And even his style is jumpy. You know, it's kind of dancified. And you can kind of see how, um, you know, it just has that feel. And then it was really cool that he explored, you know, here's funk today, but I can use this. Um, as my fill and it fit in great. So uh, hopefully that was what you wanted to learn about second line. So anybody have any questions about second line drumming before we go on to the next thing? Do, do you play buzz rolls only on a snare or do you play it on other drums? 
You mostly play it on a snare, but you certainly could play it on other drums. Most of the time it's going to be in this style or also in, like I said, in orchestra. Um, you wouldn't like buzz on a timpani, for instance. You know, it's timpani is an instrument that, that's meant to be very articulate. You know, boom, 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 and you're you're augmenting the orchestra. Buzzes um, uh, oftentimes are used like on the snare of the orchestra, or they can be used, you know, in this style. But in a lot of other styles, we don't really use the buzz very much. And in fact, my drum teacher, when I was coming up, basically told me, never do buzz rolls. I will not teach buzz rolls. You are not to buzz. And so um, I was like, okay. So um, he wanted me to develop, you know, a lot of finger technique and to be very articulate, more drum core style. So I had to go back and learn buzzing. And I find that I don't use it very much, but I don't play this style of music. And if I did, I would certainly have to um, learn how to adopt it. Another thing that I never really learned that I'm actually exploring now now, just on my own, is a lot of ghosting on the snare. So ghosting is where you do these little baby notes. And sometimes you'll see some other players. We've watched videos. I'll have to point them out when I see them again. But they kind of keep time, you know, um, in between. There's little baby notes on the snare that are not meant to really be heard. And in fact, when they write for them, and we've seen some of this, they put a little parenthesis around them. It means I want you to play it, but so incredibly quiet that it should be inaudible. And then it, that you're just kind of keeping time. And then, boom, the big snare, we want to hear that one. And the reason that ghosting is actually very valuable, we've talked about subdivisions in the past. And it really helps you develop immense great timing because you're keeping those little notes there. And so whenever you keep them there, you're much more accurate when the big notes come. If the big notes are every so often and there's a lot of space, there's a chance to be a tiny bit early or a tiny bit late. But if you're constantly keeping that little thing going down below or feathering, sometimes in jazz playing we'll call it feathering, either with the brushes or with the just the stick and you can see when people are playing there's all these little notes on the snare and then bam and then bam and then a whole bunch of little ones they're just kind of keeping really good time so um so it's interesting how you know again how sort of things change and I think anything in history it's like kind of like fashion things come back in style so like when I was growing up no traditional grip no buzz rolls none of this and then now it's kind of like okay it's cool to do that but in this situation or that situation and so it's kind of interesting how like fashion evolves if you wait long enough whatever you have in your closet is going to come back and be cool again so you know you don't have to always get rid of it um and i think that's true of just about anything like it gets resurrected maybe in a new form but it still kind of has that same vibe so anybody else have any observations or questions about second line if not i want to go on to the next thing i want to get us playing so i developed a new tune for us you've seen this before but not in this particular order and I didn't put a lot of repeats because we're kind of getting more advanced and I don't want to make this boring for you to play the same thing over and over so I mixed and matched it so that it's not sort of predictable and um, it's kind of willy-nilly and so we could either clap it or play it um, but let's just kind of review. So coconut shrimp is basically like coconut shrimp. So maybe let's just try that. I'll give you four, and then let's clap coconut shrimp over and over. One, two, three, four. Coconut shrimp. Coconut shrimp. Coconut shrimp. Coconut shrimp. Or you could go da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Right, left, right, left. So that's going to be our coconut shrimp. Avocado toast, we have done this a ton. It could be pepperoni pizza or pepperoni something. Pepperoni pie, I guess it could be. So let's do avocado toast. So one, two, three, four. Avocado toast. Avocado toast. Avocado toast. Then we have our chips and guacamole. All right, one, two, here we go. Chips and guacamole. Chips and guacamole. Chips and guacamole chips and guacamole if we put this together let's try it i'm going to give you four i'm going to play the first line all in a row just like that one two here we go 
coconut shrimp, avocado toast, chips, and guacamole. One more time. One, two, here we go. Coconut shrimp, avocado toast, chips, and guacamole. Okay, next line. We got a hot fudge sundae coming up here. So one, two, here we go. Hot fudge sundae. That's not too bad. We got our coconut shrimp twice in a row after that. So let's try that whole line. One, two, three, four. Hot sundae, coconut shrimp, coconut shrimp. Okay. And next, if we scroll down, uh, can we scroll down? Let's make it a little smaller if possible. Try to make it a little smaller without making it too small that we can't see it. And I can send this to you to practice. Oh, another line. And this line's long. It's got four things in it. Starts with chips and guacamole, two milks and cereals, and an oat, a cinnamon oatmeal. Let's see if I can make that a little bigger. We can get it all on one line. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to. Pretty close. I'll try to get our faces out of the way here. Okay, so let's just try it. Let's just see what happens. I'll give you four. One, two, three, four. Chips and guacamole milk and cereal. Milk and cereal. Cinnamon oatmeal. And you notice some of these have multiple names. So like for instance, this figure is a cereal and over here it's a cinnamon. It's not meant to be confusing, but just know you could substitute any old words that you want. It's the same rhythm. This rhythm is tapped the same way this one is. And this one, oatmeal, is the same as milk and. It's also the same as chips and. So um, hopefully that's not confusing. It's just meant to be fun. Um, so let's try that whole line. One, two, here we go. Chips and guacamole, milk and cereal, milk and cereal, cinnamon, oatmeal. Okay, and the last line we have is tater tot casserole, tater tot casserole, strawberry ice cream, and back to avocado toast. Let's see what happens. Uh, about like one, two, here we go. Tater tot casserole, strawberry ice cream, avocado toast. All right, now can we do the whole thing in a row? And I will send this to you if I have your email as homework, and we can do it again next week. Why don't we try the first two lines, because that's what we can kind of see right here. And let's slow it down just a tad. How about, like, coconut shrimp? One, two, here we go. Coconut shrimp, avocado toast, chips and Guacamole, hot fudge sundae, coconut shrimp, coconut shrimp. All right, hopefully that went well. Let's try it one more time. Same thing. One, two, here we go. Coconut shrimp, avocado toast, chips and guacamole, hot fudge sundae, coconut shrimp, coconut shrimp. Okay, next two lines. Let's see if we can make the next two in a row. Here we go, starting with chips and guacamole. Not too fast. One, two, here we go. Chips and guacamole, milk and cereal, milk and cereal, cinnamon, oatmeal, tater tot, casserole, strawberry ice cream, avocado toast. I might move this to the side. I don't know if you guys can see this little bar with your pictures. Let's do that one more time. Oh, it keeps wanting to move around. Can you guys see the faces? Jasmine, can you see the people's faces? 
Can you see? Oh, you can? Okay. I'm trying to move them so that we... I'm going to put them up top. Uh, they want to go over on the side. Okay. Move them down a little bit. They want to move over there. Okay. Well, I guess the top is the best place. Here we go. Starting with chips and guacamole. One, two, here we go. Chips and guacamole, milk and cereal, milk and cereal, cinnamon, oatmeal, tater tot, casserole, strawberry ice cream, avocado toast. And I am kind of changing these eighth notes rhythm. If there's anybody who's real uh, technical musician, they'll know what I'm doing. But um, for our purposes, I think this works with this rhythm. And so anyway, I just thought it would be fun to do a new a new um, song. So I will send that to you. I also wanted to open it up for those that got a chance to watch the homework from last week. I wanted to get your thoughts. I know some of you have written me on the side. So I wanted to get your thoughts on Grayson and his jazz technique videos. And then also, I think I sent you um, the option to watch the rock climbing videos that I thought would be, you know, interesting and address Barb's question about autism and music. So did anybody get a chance to watch the Netflix uh, rock climbing videos or watch Grayson's videos? And if so, what were your thoughts? I watched Grayson. I don't have Netflix. So uh, I watched Grayson and all I could think of is, wow. I mean, it's hard enough to figure out what your feet are supposed to be doing and which drum you're supposed to be playing or cymbals or what, and what rhythm. And then he adds on there all this stuff with his fingers and his thumb. And all I could think was, don't you guys ever get carpal tunnel? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Oh, um, that yeah. Pretty impressive. Yeah, lots of practice. So, you know, that's called muscle memory. So you get to the point where, like, your muscles just memorize it and you don't have to think so hard. You think about, you know, um, the, some of the bigger notes and then you just fill in the other ones based on, you know, repetition. So, um, yeah, lots of practice. He obviously just didn't wake up and do that. Um, you know, and that's the thing. People are just like, well, you know, how much do you practice? Well, it's not the amount of time. It's smart practice. We've talked about that before, but he's obviously smart practicing and practicing a lot. And, you know, you get better at what you do. So if you do something over and over, you know, you don't have to think about it so much. Just like you know, walking down the street, you don't have to think, okay, my right leg goes and then my le left leg goes. You just do it. And meanwhile, you're talking on the phone and you're looking around. And But that took a whole lifetime. You know, when you're a baby, you couldn't do it at the beginning. So just takes time, 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 time. Other people's thoughts? Barb, did you, what did you think? Did you get a chance to watch anything? Not much. My computer died and then I couldn't get back on. It wanted me to have passwords and all kinds of weird things. So I don't know where I was. Did you find your glasses? No. And okay. I, didn't, I didn't see them. I'm still hunting. Okay. You know, whenever I lose something, which is very rare, but when I stop looking for it and I'm looking for something else, that's when I find stuff. So sometimes you just give up because um, you keep going back and thinking, well, it's got to be here. It's got to be here. And it isn't. And you just keep checking like you're hoping one day it'll appear there. And then when you least expect it, you're looking for something else, and then you're like, oh, there it is. I know. <laughs> I don't waste I your... I get a new passport. I always kept it under this wooden sewing box, and it wasn't there. Well, guess what? Five years later, it was there. It was <laughs> stuck to the bottom of the box. And oh. I had a new passport and everything. Oh, gosh, that's funny. Yeah, I've had that experience, too, where you're just like, how did I not know that? Like, oh, geez. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, so let's see. Molly, do you have any thoughts? Did you get a chance to watch videos? I want to, I missed the beginning of this thing. Of your oh, well, I'll send it to you. I okay. will send it uh, every week. I always send the PowerPoints and interesting things to watch. I had a couple other things I wanted to share with, with you all. Unless, Molly, do you have another any anything you want to add so far? Um, did, 
Uh, did you ever hear of somebody named Sandy Nelson, a rock drummer named Sandy Nelson? I think I have, but I couldn't say that I know for sure. Fill us in on Sandy Nelson. Well, he died um, on Valentine's Day. He was 83, and he was a he. Um, there, he I think maybe his big hit was "Let There Be Drums." That's what I what I saw him mostly playing. And um, in 1963, uh, he was in a motorcycle accident, and he had to have his right foot amputated and part of his right leg amputated. But he continued to play. He found some way out, some uh, some way other to play. So I, I thought he was I thought it was very interesting, and I really like "Let There Be Drums." Okay, well, let me look into uh, that for next time. Um, good, you always have great ideas for us. You know, another thing that I ran across this week, and I won't, um, I won't talk it through now, other than I want to maybe pull it up just so you know what it looks like. But so I had mentioned before to y'all that I'm in this Facebook group with seven thousand female drummers from all over the world, and there's one who. Um, you know, her name kind of kept coming up, and I was like, let me just go to her website and see what this is all about. Well, what she does is um, she does drum historical videos, and they're very short, and they're free, and they're on YouTube, and I watched one of them, and I think I'd like to send you a couple for homework to watch on your own, and then we could talk about it, but like she tackles things like how did the modern hi-hat come about? Like what was the first hi-hat? What did it look like? How was it used? Who did it? And they're short. They're less than like five minutes. And so I just want to send you that because I think they'd be really interesting. I'll send you two or three like maybe each week to watch, you know, like watch this one and this one, and then we'll talk about it. I don't want to use all our time to play videos for you, um, but I want to try to turn you on to other stuff to kind of look at on your own and then we can talk about it or expand upon it so I will send you that and maybe we'll start with the modern day hi-hat and maybe the bass drum but historically they're really interesting and how cool of a topic you know that there's probably not that much out there in like you know there's tons of drum videos and there's tons of people doing kind of how to how to do this and how to do that but we don't have a lot or I haven't stumbled across the history of even parts of the instruments or, you know, um, so I thought it was really cool. So anyway, I will send that to you. So that was something that I ran across this week. And then um, the other thing that I wanted to uh, go through, so my studio tour. So um, I put together a little PowerPoint with pictures. You know, I didn't make it too fancy. I was going to do actual video where I walk around, but I thought that would be too bumpy and everything. So I just thought, let me just take pictures of how it looks right this second, which, you know, it's messy because I'm always moving things around and trying different things. I don't keep everything exactly. You know, that's part of the creative process for me as I try to hook up different things, try different things. And so I'll tell, I'll show you what it looks like right now. And I have to tell you a funny story. So this morning, my mom has still not seen it because she can't get down the stairs. Even though I put in the stair lift, she said, you know, I don't want to see it until it's, until it's done. And I said, well, I don't know it's going to be done because it's always in progression. And I said, you know what? This is my only room, so I get to decorate, you know, and her big thing was, you know, she didn't want me to junk it up. Well, I think you probably saw the pictures before what it looked like, and it was sort of junked up before with boxes of stuff that nobody knew what anything was. At least my junk, uh, it's useful, and I'm using it, and if I don't use it, I get rid of it, but it's a lot of stuff, I will tell you that. So, so I want to share my screen and give you my little studio tour with stories a few stories I think that you'll like it um, I hope you'll like it it's kind of my life um, it's been 50 years of stuff so I didn't get this all at once and I mean I can name you the store that I bought things at what year you know because this is these are like my babies you know you remember when they're born and stuff so so here we are the official Karen Newell drum studio tour okay so picture of me here for that's my work picture and here's me playing on some African drums and then some drum set okay so let's just jump right in here so wow look at all that stuff so let me just point out a few things. So utility shelves from Home Depot. I love these things. I've put together about eight of them in the last month. 
and they're easy to put together. They don't cost that much. They're lightweight. They're plastic. They're not those metal ones that bend and everything. They're really nice. I have them in my garage. I have them in my studio. Obviously, you can move them around easily because they're super light. So that's the first thing that you notice. I've got a bunch of these things. And they're very helpful for stacking things up high, knowing where things are. I have this material here, what, which I'm going to probably cover this up so you don't have to see all that stuff. But I like to see it because I want to know where things are because I'm constantly pulling things off the shelf, setting them up, putting them back away, trying different things. So a fan, super important. I've got probably four fans in here. Here's one, here's one, here's where one. Even though I'm in Colorado and it's snowing outside, you know, drumming is very physical. It's like a workout. So I don't like to be hot. So I've always got a fan somewhere blowing on me wherever I am, and I don't want to constantly be moving them around. So I just set them up at every potential station, and then I just click the button, and I'm good to go. So I love fans. Other things you notice, we're going to talk more about the specifics, but you can just see it's a nice big room. And so let's just go to the next picture. Here's another view from the other side. More utility shelves. Um, some of this stuff came from my house, and I didn't know where to put it. Look at poor David over here in the corner, you know, like he didn't have a home. So I'm like, oh, put him in the studio. Um, so I've got a mismatch of, you know, art and music and whatever. But I like... Uh, I don't want a plain wall. I like inspiration. I like color. I want to see, you know, the carpet's interesting. I like, not too busy, but I mean, I like stuff. Uh, it it's just helps my creative process. I mean, I even use my African drum as a stand for my for my uh, fan. So I mean, I try to be functional, <laughs> but I know where my drum is here. You know, I know where it's at. I can pull it out if I need it, but it's actually useful and serving a purpose. So let's just keep going here, see what else we see. More stuff um, everywhere, right? And try to be organized and neat about it, but also try to have, I can't have everything set up at once. So I kind of am always, okay, let me set this set up and, you know, do something on it. Okay, well, now I want to do something else. And I'm always um, finagling things, and that's fun for me. So at the ceiling, very important. So I actually you know, was able to construct this room. So I wanted electrical in the ceiling and this is why. So I have a GoPro up here and actually I can show you in a moment, I'll show you um, the view from the GoPro. That's that one right there. Eventually, I don't want to kill myself and break my arm. So, but this wire is going to end up in that corner and there's going to be these little U things that you nail up there so that it doesn't look like this because this looks terrible but I also don't want to break my arm and then I can't play so um, I have to get up pretty high on a ladder so I might have somebody come and do this so just you know that's nothing worse than having a beautiful studio and breaking your arm or something so um, eventually this wire won't look like that it'll be tucked in this corner it'll come all the way across here it'll go down the, in the corner but I have it connected so I don't have to climb up there every two minutes to change the battery and turn it on and off I can do it remote so very important you know and that wasn't that big of a deal for the construction people just can you put an electrical outlet up there yeah that's no problem so as you're you know developing if you have a empty room these are things you want to think about electrical and lighting super 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 important doesn't really cost all that much but you have to put it in the right places so really important with that um, just more, you know, stands being organized, which stands are on what shelf so that I don't have to fumble through and find things. Um, moving on to, um, I have bookshelves, lots of bookshelves. This is actually behind the stairs, so you don't have to look at it. But I have everything organized, all the books I teach out of, all the music that I like to use. Um, these are two separate bookshelves. And you see back here the human head. So I got a little bit of my previous career, had to go somewhere. This was like a model that I put together when I was 15. And it has been with me everywhere. Um, you know, when I was 15, actually the funny story was I was making my, it was like a, a religious uh, ceremony. It was like a confirmation. And my parents asked me what I wanted, like a ring or a necklace or whatever. And I was like, I really want the human head uh, model. And, you know, thank goodness they gave it to me. I'm still doing, you know, I had a whole career in medicine and I totally love this thing. And a ring would have been such a waste for me. It, it would probably, I would have never worn it. I would have, it was no big deal, which just wasn't my thing. And I'm so glad that they let me be myself and not like make me have earrings or something. And just like, I don't want earrings. I want the human head, you know, and it served me well. So anyway, he's still with me. Um, 
Okay, so let's just keep going here. So it's just, it's an interesting eclectic uh, mix of things. So here, these little kid bins are great for putting stuff in and knowing where things are. So they're not just for preschoolers. They're for, you know, musicians too. And I just, I like to be organized and know where things are. It might not look like I'm organized, but I have all my gear kind of in different places. And so that's, those are useful. I love those kind of things. The pachinko machine I already talked about. It's in the wall. Here's the back of it. So I can easily access that. And one of these days I'm going to go back here and change the spring out and blow the dust out of it and get it functional again. Right now it sort of works, but it needs to be, needs a little love. It's, you know, it's like 40 or 50 years old or more and it, it needs a little, uh, needs something. So that's, you know, being retired, I hope I have time to do that someday. So I love these little hooks again from Home Depot or wherever they uh, supposedly when you take them off the wall you can take them off. You know the commercial always looks so easy like you take it off and it doesn't hurt the paint. Well in my last studio it ripped the wall off and I had to have painters come in but um, I don't plan to take these off the wall for a long time. So anyway it's just a helpful way you know if you're a musician you have chords. I have boxes of chords and, and some are really old that probably don't even aren't useful anymore but I keep them just in case and so but these are the ones I use like all the time like I, almost every day I'm pulling a, this cord off and pulling that cord off for recording or doing different things or transferring cassette tapes to computer digitizing things you know I'm always finagling something so um, I love these little hooks and so they come in handy I have a bunch of those in the back these are tenor pads, so you can see, you know, um, sometimes I don't want to play noisily, so I've got two, two sets of tenor pads, so here's one. These are, you know, tenor drums. I just put them on a table, and um, this one here, here's the number one drum, two drum, three drum, which has got another pad on top, and the four drum. And then you could have a choice of, you know, tenors come in. You could have this pad and this pad with these four. That would be a six pack, they call it. Or you could have the center one, and that would be a quince, quintuplets, whoops, uh, five drums. You typically will never see an eight, not real ones. So for the pads, this is a cool pad. This is a Tim Jackson pad, and we've, I think, talked about Tim Jackson in the past. I got a chance to meet him. Great tenor player. You can YouTube him. Maybe I'll send you one of his videos this week. But he developed this pad that, like, you, you know, it's a great pad because if you play quince, you can practice on this pad using this, and you just ignore these two. Or if you're in a marching band and you're playing, um, a, uh, you know, a six pack, you play on this one and you play on this one and this one doesn't exist. And so you just, it's a great way to have two pads in one. Whereas, sorry, this keeps switching. Here's another pad. It's an older style. In fact, so old that I've had to replace the heads of the pad by buying additional laminates to stick on. But this was quince, a quint pad. So basically these are five drums and you can play them really quietly. And so, um, and right now I'm, I'm practicing on that stuff for the Troopers alumni course, so I'm using these pads a lot. So, uh, and I like to have two because if I ever have a student live again, you know, I'm on one side and they're on the other side and, and we can be playing next to each other and it works out, you know, really well. So, um, again, more utility shelves, drums everywhere, um, and eventually I will get rid of some of these drums. Right now, a lot of these three sets of drums I refurbished, and I haven't even played them yet. And so I don't want to just sell them before I've, and I spent hours getting them pretty because they were in a trash pile, and I fixed them and brought them back to life. So that's why they, they live, but someday they'll be, somebody else will get a chance to play on them. But I just am not ready to get rid of them yet. Um, and so here's my, where I'm sitting right now is in this chair. These are my electronic drums that I play all the time. Here's a screen that's right here behind me that I can make things really big. Put my computer right in here. And this is my Earth, Wind & Fire album wall. So Earth, Wind & Fire was one of my favorite bands growing up. And so I have, and I have more than that of the albums. But those are the ones that I, I mean, I played the heck out of those. If, if you pulled the vinyl out on these things, it's probably just like smooth, you know, because hours and hours and hours. This was my band, and I played, I pl I practiced Earth, Wind, and Fire. That was my band, you know. So they they're special to me, uh, especially this album right here, my favorite song of all time. I can tell you the number. I don't always know the names, but I can tell you like which album and which. Uh, it, it's the sixth song. It's the seventh song. It's the first song. Um, 
because I would have to go back and put it on and then run over to my drums and play and then run over and put it on. It wasn't like now just go click, click and put it on a loop and play it for an hour. I actually had to physically find the spot, you know, very carefully lower it down. You, you all know what I'm talking about. So anyway, this is a special wall for me. So when my mom sees this, so when I showed her this, I don't remember if I told you this part, she hadn't seen anything yet. She said, well, what are you going to do with your class today? And I said, well, I'm going to give them a tour of the studio. And she said, well, I haven't even had had a tour and I said well mom I'm a little worried about showing you you know showing it to you I, are you ready and you know so as soon as she saw the first slide she said holy s word <laughs> and she's not really much of a cursor but I think it surprised her so um, I was just like don't worry don't worry everything's in the one room I'm not exploding out into the rest of the house you got the rest of everything but this is my one place that I get to you know do my thing and I don't want all this stuff in a box you know I don't want all these in a box you know I want to see them and maybe I'll rotate them out I can't put everything on the wall obviously I have too much stuff tickets and everything else and I'm slowly purging and getting rid of like tickets that you can barely even read who it was but I know it was special so I'm letting those go but some of this stuff I gotta I gotta have it here so this is my earth wind and fire station and then if you look over I have a little Gene Krupa area, so I've got these two pictures of Krupa, and then a friend of mine for Christmas a couple of years ago gave me this card, this, um, she either drew it or colored it in, I think she drew it and colored it in, but it's Krupa, and it's pretty much, she probably took this from like, it looks a lot like some of these pictures, she looked at a picture, and she colored it, and I just thought, oh, what a great gift, you know, so very, very thoughtful, and, um, so he belonged in the in the set here and then of course on another wall my buddy rich and if you look carefully here's a ticket a ticket from the first time i saw him got to meet him my dad must have slipped somebody something because we got to go downstairs this was a dinner a dinner jazz club so you have dinner and then you watch the show i was like the only kid in the place and um, and i'm there with my dad and you know at the end we got to go downstairs. I don't know how that happened, but I don't think it was just by chance. So we went down, we walked through this wine cellar. This is a tiny little club in Denver. It doesn't exist anymore. If you look carefully on the ticket, the ticket price is six bucks. You know, that was a lot. Um, and so, and you can see a signature. So I got to go down and talk to him and I'll never forget. He was drinking milk out of a wine glass or like a champagne glass. And, um, and he was like, bring me my special pen, you know, and everybody's running around because nobody wanted to make Buddy mad because he would yell and scream and fire you right on the spot. So he's like, I need my special pen, you know, and like 20 people go run in for it and they come back and he signed it. And he was very nice to me, but, um, and I got to meet him two or three times after that. So that was just like, wow, that is like my, one of my most special things in the world is that picture and that ticket. So that was like... I mean, way cool. Um, other things that are hanging, I have all these drum heads. I don't have a lot of them hung up yet because I'm running out of space, but I did hang this one up. This is my most recent one from a conference I went to. And whoever I got to sign, and, you know, the thing is I recognize all these guys because I'm old, and I know all of them. And a lot of the kids that are there, the young kids that are coming up, they're just walking right, they're standing in line to get a hot dog right behind somebody who's like, wow, wow no idea at all but I know who they are so I go up introduce myself and tell them I've been you know following them along and can I get a picture or can I get an autograph you know I'm like worse than a kid but here here's the autograph and then here's the the picture of me with the person and so this is Wooten we've talked about him he's still around he does a lot with rudimental drumming if you go to Vic Firth website you'll see him great instructor um, in fact, he's got his PhD in music, and um, they call him Dr. Wooten. And then over here, this is Bill Bachman, famous tenor player, has got his own book. In fact, there's the book right there. I teach out of it. Great player. Here's um, uh, Hidalgo, this guy, Giovanni Hidalgo, one of the most famous. He is the most and uh, most famous conga player on the planet and he's the one who if you look carefully in the picture you can't see it but he had band-aids will actually tape over all of his fingers because he has diabetes and he's actually his fingers are um 
they're sloughing off. And he's still playing. He was he played and he played amazing. But it's very sad. He's actually my age. He's actually just a tiny bit younger. But and he's a little short guy. But anyway, super fam famous conga player. And then La Lalo Davila writes a lot of percussion ensemble pieces. Uh, he's in Tennessee. He's a really great drum instructor. If I was a kid coming up, I would want to go to his school and be taught by him. So, um, so anyway, that's my most recent wall. And I have others, which maybe I'll share with you another time of older folks that, um, I've kind of followed along and the boom whacker wall, of course, you got to find where you're going to put your boom whackers. I hate having them all over the floor or in a box. So, you know, they're pretty decorative. So I put uh, I put little Velcro on them, and I just like in my old house, I had them going down the stairs. I've got them in order. So here's, you know, C, D, E, F, G. You guys played these. And then here's the ones that are the flats and the sharps. They're over here, separate little station. I got my little computer station. Whoops. This is where I, this is my headquarters. I feel like an air traffic controller when I'm here. And then I've got a, you know, printer and just some ancillary office kind of stuff because a lot of times I'm writing things down and all of that. Again, just bins. I love these little bins. I have little screws and things that fall off. I don't know where it goes. Uh, it's important. Just throw it in here until I figure it out. So little parts are in, in these little things. And, you know, you got to hang a bird up. I, I like to have different, um, you know, I want a parrot in my studio. I mean, you know, who who wouldn't want a parrot in their studio? So I've got stuff like that, just random, random things. Um, here's my tenors. So these are actually the, here's the number one drum. And notice the little tape. I put tape on these because sometimes when I'm trying to figure out a really complicated pattern, instead of thinking, you know, we, we call this the one drum because it goes in order from size, so from high to low. So we, we call this one the Spock drum, and sometimes there's a second drum here. So but we mostly call this the one drum. This is the two drum, the three drum, the four drum because it goes right, left, right, left, down the line, high to low. But sometimes it's hard to think, you know, two, one, three, three, four, one, one, two, you know, whatever. Uh, it's easier to think blue, green, red, red, yellow, yellow, blue, you know. And so I actually, on a complicated piece of music, I get out colored pencils. And I, over the top of each note, I put the color. Because colors to your brain, I've discovered this, and I use this in my teaching. At least for me, numbers are not as fast as colors. So, you know, colors are very primary, rudimentary. When you're tiny, the first thing you learn is your colors before your numbers. And it's true. When you're doing a complicated pattern... If I'm trying to think three, two, one, one, three, four, 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 two, I can't even sing it that fast. But the colors, your brain can recognize it. And so once you get the pattern down, then you don't have to think so hard. But this is my color scheme. This is what I want this one to be blue because it's I like blue. And number one is used a lot. And then green is used a lot. And then yellow's not as much. Black's not as much. And then I've got red. Red is like fiery, like here I am. It's the top note. And so it helps me a lot to be able to um, learn music, um, especially hard music, using color. So you can see that's what the tape is all about there. And here's my other drum set, electronic drum set that I have set up. And they're different. I go back and forth between the two um, all the time. This one has more mesh heads. This is an older style. And the other one's more newer. And they each have advantages and disadvantages. And then, of course, over in the corner, I've got the more bins. I've got this one's got cords in it. These have got sticks in it. I actually put little twist ties around sticks so they stay together. I think you guys have seen that before. I have um, medicine containers that I save and put tape over them and put, like we talked about, make shakers out of them. So if I ever get to go back to a senior center in person, I've taken my shakers with me. I'm taking down here is the golf tubes. You probably can't see them. They're underneath our names. Their golf tubes are there. And um, Everything's organized, and I can just grab stuff out of a bin, throw it in a bucket, and, and go. So this is function. It might look like a bunch of junk. I'm sure if the fire department came in my house, they'd be like, oh, my gosh, what is this place? But it's all stuff that I use all the time. And more toys. You guys have seen a lot of these toys, gotten to play some of these toys I know in the past. And the percussion wall. So I had to have the earth and wind and fire wall and the percussion wall. So I don't have all my percussion, but I put special ones. A, I know where they are, so I don't have to go look for them. 
And B, some of them have a story because I got them in a certain place. Like these little drums I got in Italy. They were, I got in Pisa and they came from Africa. And so somebody came across from Africa, went to Pisa, had a little market, a little flea market, and they made these. So it was very, it wasn't just shipped over. Like the person who made them was at the market. And I was like, oh my gosh, I know these aren't from Italy, but wow, these are so cool. And so I, you know, each one has like a little story of, you know, where I got it. And some of them I've started to put tags on them because I can't remember anymore, like where I got it or who gave it to me or where it's from or what the story was. So I have little tags. It's like a museum, you know, but um, it helps me to know I got modern stuff. I've got my tambourine I use all the time, my vibra slap, my flexitone, and then I've got more kind of ancient older kinds of things on that particular wall but I just think it's looks cool if I make a video on this drum set that's the background I think that's awesome background rather than just a plain blue wall okay so we have to end with my favorite story we only have four minutes left so um, in 1974 I went to Italy with my family and we were on a train that, um, it's a long story, but basically we got separated from one another. So I was a little kid and, um, and I was with my grandmother and my mom and dad were on separate uh, trains because these trains would pull into a village. And if you're in the last car, they just drop you off and then the train keeps going to the next town. And then if you're in that last car, they drop you off. Well, nobody told us that. And so all of a sudden we found out uh, you better get off this car because it's stopping in this city and I know you guys are going to Milan and we're in Germany. So um, you might want to move up. And so um, so my dad and mom take the luggage and take off and leave me and my grandmother. So anyway, the train stops and we're in the last car. And so like we better get off and get back on the train. And anyway, it was this harrowing experience. We did get all back together, but what happened was our luggage uh, went somewhere else. A lot of our luggage did. So for five weeks in Italy, we didn't have clothes or toothbrushes or anything, but we were with our family members, and so they lent us clothes and things to wear and everything. But anyway, my drumsticks got lost, and my dad felt really bad because I wasn't practicing, and it was like a month. You know, we were going to be there like basically all summer long visiting our family, and um, and there, we're in this little village, and there's nothing to do. And so he went out with his pocket knife, and he got these branches and he carved me these drumsticks you know it took him like two days or something you know just all day long he's carving these drumsticks and he gave them to me he was so proud and I was like oh wow dad these are great but like they're crooked you know I, I don't want to hurt his feelings but like I can't play with these <laughs> you know I, I don't want to be a jerk or anything but like they're really crooked and I cannot practice with these um, and so guess what he went out and this was his second try and these things are awesome. And I have had them with me ever since. Wherever I go, they're hanging in my studio. And they are just super special, just like my Buddy Rich uh, picture. So, like, here they are. They're on the wall. So if my mom gives me trouble and says, I junked it up, I'm going to say, Mom, do you consider this junk? I think she wouldn't agree. I think she would be like, you're right, okay. Uh, your dad made those. They belong on the wall. So hopefully. Um, so anyway, that is my studio. That's my life. Uh, questions about any of that? There was something on the wall with all your gadgets. Uh huh. It looked like a little. It looked like a little triangular something it was on the bottom. Okay. Let me let me pull that one up. Hang on, I'm closing all these other, other it things. Looks like a little jet, like a little. Okay. Like this. Okay, hang on. Let me let me pull it up. I know we only have a minute left. And also, what are you doing about like what's, where's the water upstairs? What are you doing if a pipe breaks or something and it comes down there? What's above oh. you? Any water? Uh, well, I mean, there's always water, I guess, in a house, but um, no, I don't think. Here, let's see. Um. Am I still sharing? Am I still sharing? Look, you need to get these for upstairs. Water alarm. Yeah. Wow, you're prepared for the end of the world, Barb. Well, <laughs> I've had I've had some major water leaks in my downstairs condo, but these oh. things are incredible. And you put them under your kitchen cabinets in any place where there's water upstairs. And it'll okay. go off like a bomb, you know. Well, the good news is that I don't go anywhere, and neither does my mom. And, like, we're here all the time. So, um, 
I think we probably know, but you never know. You're right. I mean, it is good to be prepared. Um, can you see this picture? Yep, it's above the orange drums. That one. That one. Okay, so it's actually three things. It's two different, oh. and I can get it. You know, next week we're running out of time, but this is a cowbell, and this is a cowbell, and this is the stick that has a string to it that you play on it. Oh, I get it now. Yeah, yeah. I get you. So, I know we kind of, it's 11 o'clock, or I mean, it's one year time, so we're going to have to stop. But if you have questions, um, uh, remember them. And next week we'll do the, the video that's in the chat, and I'll send you some drum homework. And send today's, please. I will, I will. All right, everybody, have a Thank good weekend. You. And thanks Thank for you. sending that whole list of things. I didn't see any glasses, but. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, Joanne's here. Hi, Joanne. I yeah. didn't know you joined us. Awesome. Yeah, I, I was having some issues. Sorry. Okay. Hey, I'll send you the video so you won't miss anything. Okay. Thank you. Okay, what okay. about passwords and things? I had trouble getting back in. Was, is there Stand by. I'll find out. I'll find out. All right. I know they have another class, so we have to go. Okay. All right, guys. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.